Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Joe and Joe Weather Show on this Tuesday, the 18th of January, 2022, and the Joe and Joe Weather Show brought to you by, as it is every night, by Omni True Value Hardware, your superstore for everything you need to get you through this winter when these winter storms come and go. Uh, they have uh, got salt, sand, pelado, calcium de-icer, you name it, they got it. And you uh, can see what the store looks like on the outside. We got, uh, they've got snow blowers ready in case you need one. Uh, you've got mag, ice pellets and flakes and pelado and spreaders and, of course, rock salt. And the largest supplier of rock salt in the, Newark, in the New York, New Jersey, Long, Connecticut tri-state area. So head over to Omni at 1226 North Wellwood Avenue in West Babylon. Uh, the telephone number is, whoops, didn't have to do that one. Uh, there we go. The telephone number is 631-756-1125. Right in West Babylon on Long Island. Easy access from Sunrise Highway to the south or the Long Island Expressway to the north. And the website is omnitruevalue.com, Mr. Rayo. So here we are. Let's say a big hello, by the way, to uh, our buddy William Hoover, who is uh, getting a little energy back, or at least enough energy to watch the show tonight. We wish him well and a speedy recovery from what you've been going through. So get better quick. Three weeks is a long time, Bill. Time to get better. Yes, and um, yeah, three weeks is, is much too long. Uh, you know, you you. I, from what I've heard, Joe, people who have uh, had the uh, the vaccine uh, and yet still end up getting the uh, the uh, COVID uh, in them actually stave off the worst effects of uh, of COVID. They uh, it, it, to them it's more like just a bad cold. It, again, the most important thing is that if you um, are not vaccinated, get vaccinated as quickly as you can because if you don't get vaccinated, you get COVID. It could end up with something. Uh, considerably worse. So that's the that's the editorial opinion there. And as far as uh, Omni True Value is concerned, I, I think a lot of people could have used that rock salt or carbian car, carbian carbon calcium. I'm not even going to try calcium I, chloride. Whatever, can, calcium chloride. Blah, is that blah, what you're blah, looking blah, blah, blah. for? Calcium yes, chloride. Yes. All right. Whatever you, whatever you put on your drive, I, mean, I think a lot of people could have used it this morning because in the aftermath of yesterday, uh, I know, for example, my driveway was fairly iced over this morning. And uh, a lot of people I know could have used some uh, chemicals or some rock salt on their driveways. Uh, and uh, the fun is going to continue. It looks like tomorrow night and into early Thursday, more fun for the Thursday morning commute. And we'll talk about that. And I know we're also going to be talking about the uh, who knows threat for Sunday yeah, I mean, for the weekend. Who You know, I, I have to tell you quite honestly, I, I, there were several points today where I just literally threw my hands up in the air trying to figure out um, uh, what exactly, how this was all going to play out uh, with respect to uh, the weekend and the next week. And you know what? The bottom line is, Nothing may happen. <laughs> At the end of the day, nothing may happen out of all of this, at least up uh, in uh, our, our neck of the woods, eastern Pennsylvania to southern New England. Uh, th there's um, uh, it's just so many working pieces. And I think the biggest frustration for me was going from run to run and model to model and just kind of looking at things and seeing you know, all, certain models doing different things, some of them, cra you know, cra one crazier than the other. And then in the midst of all that, I happen to notice the fact that on the on the GFS, just as an example, I think for the last five or five runs or more, uh, it's as if somebody just like cut and pasted uh, the uh, GFS from, from, from a couple of days ago and just is basically running it over and over and over again because... It, it has hardly changed. It's been uh, probably the, the the only probably the one model that has been just incredibly consistent over the last several days. And, and if that's the case, then um, soul lovers are not going to be too happy with regards to whatever happens this weekend. But you're right. First things first is Thursday, and 
I never like these types of systems, by the way, the one that's coming Thursday, because those are the ones that you look at and you say, okay, you know, it snows for four to, you know, maybe six hours. It's a front with some overrunning. Uh, you, you, you think, all right, you wind up with maybe a coating to a few inches. And then when it's all said and done, you're going to find that there's probably going to be a few places that, that eventually wind up with four or five or even six. And then you, and you look at it and you, you would just ask, then you look at it in aftermath and you're like, how, where, why, how did this happen? Uh, it, 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 it's, it's a, um, it's a frustrating forecast exercise. I'm going for, you know, I'm going for a few inch, you know, the possibility for up to a few inches. Some places might get as little as a coating. Some places might get one or two. Maybe somebody pushes it to three. Um, but if we if we if we're here Thursday night doing the show and we look, we're looking and we and we find a few places that wind up getting more than that, it's probably not. It, don't be don't be surprised. So let's put it that way. Don't be surprised. Actually, I think the the main concern tomorrow night is the fact that uh, it, this is, after all, a, a, a strong Arctic front that's going to be moving through, that's going to be generating the precipitation. Tomorrow, temperatures are going to be climbing. I think here in the Hudson Valley, Joe, we could see a few places get as high as 44 or even 46 degrees. So it'll still be rather balmy tomorrow evening. And then as the front begins to move in after midnight, I think the first bit of precipitation is going to be Rain. More in the form of rain as yeah. opposed to snow. Now, here's the problem. The problem is that a lot of communities, a lot of cities or townships do not brine or do not treat roads uh, when rain is expected because the rain usually tends to wash, wash away, it away. Or diminish, diminish that, d diminish the effect of that, uh, the, those chemicals. So they say, well, if it's going to rain, there's no use of us doing anything to the roads. So they don't. Then it rains. Then it turns colder. Then as we get on toward the morning commute on Thursday, it turns cold enough so that the roads are starting to ice up a little bit. The precipitation has now changed over to snow and is now accumulating. And now people get into trouble because, again, some of the roadways haven't been treated. So you have people slipping and sliding all over the place. And so even with a little bit of snow, and I'm not talking about a surprise five or six inches. Yeah, but even is, with only an inch or two, right. you could get you it, the whole morning commute could be wiped out. And then they start ranting and raving and saying, what the heck? Didn't they know it was going to stop? You know, it's it's that kind of a thing uh, I yeah. think, coming up. For the uh, morning. Nine, well, oftentimes it's the, it's, it's the coating to a couple of inches that wind up causing far more trouble than the, than the bigger ones. Cause when you get the bigger ones, you know, to, you know, a lot of people just decide, you know what, I'm not going out in this. Speaking of going out, <clears throat> I was able to get out of the house today because yesterday, uh, yesterday was Joe the dead of winter. I mean, it really was the dead of winter. Um, I, I had uh, you when 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 were we on last? We were on last on um, Sunday. Sunday. Okay, so Sunday. we didn't discuss this. You beat me in in the snow total this time around. Uh, I had a, an inch early Sunday morning. Uh, we had the show. I remember I said that this uh, changed over to snow. Well, it did. And then as soon as the show was over, the snow pretty much stopped. It really didn't do much of anything during, during the whole afternoon. And I kept looking outside and I noticed that, you know, that white haze that was off to the south of me. And then there was a white haze that was off to the east of me. Uh, as it turned out, because it's all about that was all about the upper low and banding. So, so to the south and west of me, uh, they got every bit of four to six inches, especially in some places you get down near Gainesville. It was like uh, three to four there, and, and there were pockets of higher amounts. And then I was kind of in this hole. And then to the east of me by about 10 miles in a town uh, called Hiawassee, um, they had quite a bit. I mean, they were, and you didn't have to go that high in elevation to find six inches plus. So it was, um, I got stuck in a snow hole. I had a, I had about a little over an inch last night. I'm sorry, Sunday night. Yesterday, overcast all day long. I mean, a really heavy overcast. Temperatures in the 20s. An inch and a quarter of snow. Everything was frozen. The roads were all icy. So I couldn't get out. 
And then thankfully today, uh, the sun came out. We got up into the middle 40s and just about everything melted. You know, there's some pocked patches on some of the grassy areas in the shade that uh, that didn't melt. But uh, it, was it was very interesting here yesterday because it really felt like I was someplace up north in the dead, you know, on a on a dead winter day where uh, you couldn't go out and you couldn't do anything. But today was better. And uh, <clears throat> why don't we uh, why don't we start off tonight? We take a look uh, at the uh, what's going on. Uh, we'll run through all the models. And, I, and, I, and as, I, as I said on Sunday, the thing that I was concerned about about Sunday night, Monday morning is the fact that. We did get snow up here in Putnam Valley. We had 1.7 inches accumulated by 1145 Sunday evening. I stopped measuring at that point. Temperatures were still uh, in the upper 20s, and the snow was coming down still at a pretty good clip. So in all likelihood, I picked up probably closer to three inches. The problem was that after we went above freezing, sometime after two or three in the morning, we had at least a half to maybe in some cases three quarters of an inch of rain that fell on top of all of that snow. And so what greeted me on yesterday morning, Monday morning, was not three inches of snow. Uh, what greeted me was three inches of spackle yes. on, my, on my driveway. Very heavy that's spackle. That's what it was like. Oh, my goodness. And the temperature by then, by 830 in the morning, had jumped to the high for the day of 40 degrees. So we went, look at this, Joe, 24 hours earlier, I was one degree above zero. Uh, just after midnight, I was still like 29, 30 degrees and then eight hours later, at eight or nine o'clock yesterday morning, we had jumped up to 40. Oh, and by the way, which reminds me, apparently I-95 in Connecticut was an absolute skating rink disaster. And people were wondering, because they were getting freezing rain, even up as the temperatures were approaching 40 degrees, the temperatures had risen so fast that the ground temperature didn't have time to catch up. You know, usually, it, and I remember, I, I remember an instance back, I think it was sometime in the early 90s on Long Island, where we had, we started the morning, I believe in the, in the low single digits. And in uh, precip was coming up and the, the, the wind was coming in off the ocean. So, it actually got when it got to Long Island a couple of about a few hours after we hit bottom. Uh, it, it was rain and the temperature r literally rose from five degrees to 32 degrees in like three hours. You could sit there and watch a, a, a an old fashioned mercury thermometer, just watch the red just go up. Going up. Well, we wound up getting freezing rain for about three or four, about three hours plus after that, it went above 32 because the ground was so cold that it took about two to three hours uh, before the, the ground warmed up enough that it, the, the, uh, that the rain stopped freezing. So instead of a warm ground society, what there should be is a cold ground society uh, to monitor situations <laughs> like, like this. So you're very, very unusual. Um, I'll have to say that from the standpoint of the, the, the snow forecasts, um, I, it was, uh, it's going to be hard to top that one because I, 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 I thought I did rather, I mean, I always go back and look and try to find, there were a few places where I was a little off, a little too high or, or, or a little too low, but on the whole, um, both our forecasts, I think were, were pretty good. They really were. And it's hard to, it's hard to imagine we could have done it much better. So, um, I'm a happy camper. I'm always a happy camper when it comes out right. I'm not a happy camper when it doesn't come out right because then I have to go back and look at my mistakes and figure out, you know, just what I did wrong. So uh, we're in a good place. I wasn't a happy canter, not because of the forecast, but just because the forecast came out all too true because I had been saying back last Wednesday or Thursday of last week that this is how it was going to turn out for me, at least. I mean, I envied the people. I envied my sister and my mom. They live in the Bronx. And I called up in late evening and, oh, it's raining here. And I said to myself, I wish it was raining up here because yes. I knew that that precipitation was going to turn over. And the more it snowed, the more I knew that it was going to be more difficult. And, you know, I have a I have a nice snowblower. I have a 26 inch snowblower. And, you know, with puffy, powdery snow, that snow would be flying 30, 40 feet across the way. With the snow that I had yesterday morning, 
because of the very, very heavy consistency. Like I said, it was almost like spackle. What happened yesterday morning was that the snow would come up through the chute like blah, 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 blah. And yeah. like it would the, toss it like it would like toss lava. it like maybe three or four feet. Right. Yeah, like lava. Like that. Yeah. Oh. Oh. All right. Jo Joe Rayo will be monitoring the chat board tonight uh, because uh, I'm on a single monitor, so I can't really see at the moment. So, uh, Joe, you uh, pass along whatever relevant information uh, that, uh, or even irrelevant information that uh, may be put up, and uh, we'll get uh, we'll get started here. We'll uh, bring up the uh, uh, the satellite. Uh, there was um, a little bit of snow shower activity I noticed on the radar today in a few places this morning, but. All of that's long gone, and uh, you start to see some of the high clouds moving ahead on the satellite to the west, and that's the warmer air that's headed this way for tomorrow and setting up the Arctic front for Thursday. Not much going on, at least when you look at the satellite. There's, you know, unlike what we saw over the weekend, Joe, there's no, you don't have that, the, uh, any kind of signature swirl, unless you look up in the, off the Pacific Northwest coast, it looks like something's churning out there. But uh, from the standpoint of, of uh, storms uh, really don't have a whole lot going on, but we do have on the watches and warnings map a few th a few things to mention. Uh, for example, in eastern North Dakota and western Minnesota, the counties lined up in western Minnesota near the North Dakota border are under a blizzard warning tonight, and we have winter weather advisories on either side. So um, I'm imagining that that's more due to the wind than accumulating snow, uh, but more like blowing snow. Uh, we have uh, advisories back up in parts of Montana, northeastern Colorado, winter weather advisories. And the first winter weather advisories for the um, Arctic front uh, as it moves eastward are up for uh, much of the state of Kentucky. And I imagine uh, there'll probably be uh, some more added uh, when we're uh, doing this at this time tomorrow. So I, I want to show the uh, snow forecast map. I'm going to just give this a quick let me see if I can do do this. I'm going to try to quickly refresh this. And because they, they update and then, uh, you know, they update these maps sometimes between five and six in the afternoon. So I have to sort of re, you know, bring it back down. So while this is loading, uh, I think what we could do is I'll jump over to WPC and we'll look at, uh, the surface right now, where the core of the coldest current air mass is in North Carolina and moving out, and you see the southwest isobars uh, that are blowing across uh, Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio. So that's some of the warmer air coming eastward. Temperatures at uh, 4 o'clock this afternoon. Uh, a lot of 40s uh, across uh, the, the uh, uh, Ohio Valley. So that's the air that's coming for tomorrow. And there's the low. You know, you have the slow in uh, eastern Minnesota. And uh, again, the blizzard warning more for the wind. Although it is quite, quite it's certainly quite cold behind this uh, uh, front, by the way. Temperatures uh, down in the single digits and going below zero is another one of these cold highs. See it up there in Canada with double digit below zero readings getting ready to come down. Uh, so that cold air, it's a sharp front from the standpoint of temperatures. And it's also a setup where we have um, a little bit of overrunning. And I think I, I have a graphic. That I did. Let me see if I can uh, remember where it is, and I'll bring it up. And I believe it is. Uh, it was either this one. Yep, there it is. So uh, you can see it on the screen here. This is what the setup is. Go what's happening on Thursday? So we've got this front that's coming through, and it's slow moving, or at least it's going to slow down some more when it gets offshore. There's a, it's hard to find, uh, but there's a tiny little wave that's going to develop on that front, just a little kink that's going to ripple along. And you, we've got southwest winds aloft here. Uh, even though the, the cold air is coming in, uh, the winds aloft are going to be southwest. And that's, you know, that's, that's warmer air. Uh, in the upper atmosphere, and you're going to have this cold air, this dense cold air coming in at the low levels. And as, as a result, we're getting a little bit of overrunning 
on the west side of the front. And that's why it quickly changes over to snow because the cold air is, should, should push in rather fast. We don't have far to go uh, by the, to get to uh, the freezing mark comes come Thursday morning. And there's going to be a, a narrow area of snow and some of that steady snow that will come through Thursday morning. And I think most of it will probably be done by 12 or 1 o'clock, and then it'll move away. Right, so so it's about, you know, four or, five, four or five hours. And sometimes in situations like this, you get a couple of little bands where it snows uh, a, a solid light or a, a, even a, a couple of moderate snows where you get uh, – snow to come down in about an inch an hour for a couple of hours. Somebody puts down a quick two or three inches. And I think that's what we, we, we may will probably see from uh, northeast Virginia right on up through southeastern Pennsylvania, New Jersey, south central PA in there too, Maryland, Delaware, uh, up to uh, Long Island and uh, the Hudson Valley. Uh, it cuts off a bit when you go to the north, say north of Poughkeepsie or a little bit further north than that. And then uh, the northern edge uh, running up to about Boston. So this is sort of narrow um, area. And then when that little ripple goes by, the front's going to push a little bit further south, and then it's going to stall again. And then we're going to have to wait and see, you know, what happens afterwards with regards to how that all evolves for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Because, you know, different models are doing different things. And I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm quite honestly, Joe, I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I'm not, I'm really not sure about how this all plays out. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not necessarily leaning to the idea that it's going to play out in some sort of really stormy way, but just in general, just to just in terms of kind of laying out the 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 way the forecast is going to work from Friday through Sunday. I'm not I'm not uh, I'm not sure about where precip is going to be, uh, where precip is not going to be, where is the low going to form. You know, which wave is it on that front? There's going to be another wave. Which one or another two waves? Is it both? Is it one right. of them? Just just a very, it, 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 it's, it, it's very convoluted. There's not a whole lot of clarity here. And uh, it just makes it, it just makes for a very frustrating forecast uh, challenge. Well, you know, you were right. The, the, the GFS, at least on the 12Z run, gave us not one but two uh, waves of low pressure. The first wave on Saturday does nothing. It passes off to our south, but the second wave does pass close enough to give us some precip. And in fact, on the uh, on the uh, GFSX, the extended forecast, the tabular or the numerical uh, model, the conditional uh, snow amount, they gave White Plains six inches are you, on Sunday. Are and you I'm kidding? Assuming, I, really? No, and I'm assuming that. I'm assuming that that was from the second wave, that second uh, batch of precipitation that follows the first batch. Everybody's talking about the Saturday storm, uh, and the European only had one singular system. But again, the LFM kind of split into two parts, and the second part is the one that supposedly is going to get us based on the GFS on Sunday. Yeah, you said LFM. And, uh, I think I, you meant GFS, right? Did I say? Did I say you, LFM? Yeah, you did. You had a you, ha you, you had a senior moment flashback there. Yeah, you said LFM. Because <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like something stupid that the LFM would have done. Right. So yeah, the so, the, the GFS so, is the only we'll one that's the, the the GFS has this like the others has a, has a low Friday night into Saturday morning that goes out underneath, and then it's got this second low that comes up for Sunday. The other models don't have the second low, so right. And the thing is, the GFS has been consistent for the last two days, showing this one, this sort of one-two situation. The European initially had one low, and it had it for late Saturday and Saturday night. It kind of compromised the two. Now it's gone to the the uh, Friday night and the Saturday morning idea, but it doesn't have anything for Sunday. Neither does the Icon, and neither does the Canadian. So it, it's. Um, and then the NAM is in a, suddenly in its own world uh, in, on, uh, on on its latest run. So I, that threw me that threw me completely for a loop. So anyhow, here's the snowfall forecast maps. There's a lot of ones on here that you uh, from uh, uh, Massachusetts across Connecticut, uh, Hudson Valley, New York, uh, and then you see you know they got a two at Trenton, a two at Wilmington, and even a couple of threes down there in uh, uh, between Philadelphia and Harrisburg near the uh, near the Pennsylvania Maryland line I'm not I'm south of Harrisburg I'm not sure about you know I look it, it could wind up being anywhere I, as I said it'll be 
a coating to a few inches. I think that's a fair um, a fair assessment and a fair forecast. And by the way, if we extend this out a little bit, uh, it, it uh, actually runs down pretty far to the south, uh, down into uh, Virginia and, and North Carolina um, with respect to, uh, you know, the sort of light snow type of situation that we have with this. And just to add to the confusion, because I like to, I like to do that, so this is WPC's forecast with a probability of at least two inches, okay? So the light green is 20 to 30%. And they have New Jersey, the Hudson Valley in that 20 to 30% range. They have uh, 30 to 40% in that zone in su southern and s south, s southeast and south central PA, west of Philadelphia to about Harrisburg and south and down into Maryland and Delaware and then into Virginia, and then you see in the blue, in West Virginia and Kentucky, uh, is where we have uh, 40 to 50 and 50 to 60 percent of at least two. Uh, but uh, I didn't. I'll, I'll pull up the four, but I don't think you're going to see very much there. And um, yeah, I mean, just a very the light green is a 10 to 20 percent chance for at least four down in parts of Mar uh, Maryland, Delaware, even going into southern New Jersey. Uh, you can see for the uh, areas, it's zero to five or one to five in the brown in the brown area uh, that's up in northern New Jersey and moves up into uh, parts of Connecticut. So they're not too bullish. But Joe, just to add to the confusion on the long range, this one was also another one that kind of threw me for a bit of a loop. So Friday into Saturday, WPC has this is Friday into Saturday. Wait. Yeah, Friday into Saturday. Just took a, a, a little bit of time there to load. So look what they have here for Friday into Saturday. They've got a 30 to 50 percent chance in southern New Jersey up the coast to about Ocean, northern Ocean County. They have 10 to 30 percent to southern New England. And then they've got this large area of 30 to 50 down in Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina. And in the blue in southeastern Virginia, they got 50 to 70 percent. Now, this is Friday night into Saturday morning. This is Friday into Saturday morning. OK, then for Saturday into Sunday. And this I didn't understand either. Uh, 10 to 30 percent from, you know, south central Virginia, northeast, all of New Jersey, all the way up through New England. And then they got pockets of 30 to 50 percent. I wouldn't have expected that they would put it here, but they got the pockets of, the pockets of 30 to 50 percent up in the Hudson Valley and in northern Connecticut uh, and scattered around parts of eastern Massachusetts and southern New Hampshire. And I'm like, I'm looking at this and I was like, how did they get that if we don't even we don't even know if any lows are going to make it that far north to produce any snow at all? And I was racking my brains out trying to understand the logic behind this forecast. And if you remember with the big storm uh, from, from the big storm that we had uh, on uh, Sunday in the days leading up to that, WPC had, you know, was putting out these probability maps and you and I were sitting here wondering the same thing because they looked a little odd compared to what what was being shown by the models. And I, the, the same the same questions lie again this weekend. It said it seems almost like uh, one division the long range the guys who are drawing up the long range charts for saturday and sunday for example are not you know getting together with the 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 guys who are and gals who are putting the winter weather forecast together because it doesn't seem to make any sense it seems like the uh, the long range maps are pushing this storm out underneath us and meantime not only do they have us brushed as i as you pointed out joe in the light green, 10 to 30 percent, but there are areas right over us with the higher probabilities. And I'm yeah. saying, and I, they say, like scratch my like, how do they come up with that? If they, if 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 the long range people are saying it's going to go pretty much underneath us, then what is this? Is this a CYA forecast on based on the winter uh, division, or I, I don't know. I, I, I like I, to have one one hand washing the other. And both hands and wash washing the face. the face. Never mind. Never mind about that. I'll wash my own. Just get me the water so I can. <laughs> Was that yeah, like what Norton exactly. said? Just get me the hot water and I would do it myself. Right. Um, right. Yeah. It, it's just it's a it's it's just a very very 
uh, confusing setup. So uh, with that in mind, why don't we just, let's go to the one that we kind of know, and that's the, uh, uh, the lead system. And all the models have this with respect to uh, system number one. And I'm just gonna, I'm gonna run through the upper air here. Now this goes back to what we just experienced. And I, I, I'm bringing this up because uh, when we look at the upper air with this, if you remember, working part, working part, working part. We had three, you know, three of these uh, systems here in the flow, two in the north and one in the south for this weekend. And, you know, we struggled last week with trying to figure out how all these pieces were gonna come together. And ultimately, we saw that southern, that really vigorous upper low in the south lift up as the northern trough dive, dove in and just picked it up and brought it up the east coast, just inland of the coast. And now, of course, that trough is out. Now, as we move along and we're now into uh, first off, here we go for Wednesday into Thursday. Uh, you'll notice that the trough, the uh, trough that's approaching is very broad. It's well to the west. This is Thursday afternoon. But this is, again, you've got the surface front that's you know already through somewhere here, and you've got southwest winds aloft, while at the surface, you're going to have that cold air coming in on northeast winds, and that sets up that overrunning. So right in that zone near that front, you get a little bit of a ripple you know, right in there. There's like a little kink there, uh, just moves along, and that is the uh, mechanism to trigger off uh, the precipitation, and it, we get it. Now, as we move the GFS along, uh, going into Friday and Saturday, now here's the problem, and there's quite a few problems. Remember, we're talking pieces of puzzles here. Uh, here's one trough Friday night uh, running, and, and by the way, the other models are different. So here's one trough Friday night. Here's a southern system that's uh, coming into East Texas, and here's a third piece moving down into uh, the Northern Plains. And again, it's a situation where how these things are interacting with each other. And in this particular case, because we have something similar, the Southern system here is not that vigorous. This one is much further West and the plane system is right behind it. So again, how does this all play itself out? Well, the GFS says the system in the North goes by, just kind of stays flattish and gets out. Then you got another southern southern energy as that northern plains trough comes down. But here in this instance, uh, it, this is for Sunday, it's kind of very broad looking. It's not really all that sharp. So that leads to other questions like, well, if there is a second low, how far north does it get? How close to the coast does it get? How much energy is gonna have right. with a trough this broad? I don't know. Right. And by the way, if we go to just a comparison, take a look, you know, we'll look at the Canadian just for laughs, okay? I often say that the Canadian is, um, every once in a while the Canadian hits a home run and then the rest of the time it doesn't do very much. It's like the broken clock. Here, uh, being right twice a day, here on the Canadian, it's got this, you know, this, this this trough, look how positively tilted that is. I mean, that's, yeah, it just, it, it's just so positively tilted. It moves along and then it goes out and then you got this northern stream that just comes in and just basically overwhelms everything. And we just turn dry and really cold as we go through the rest of the week and into early next week. So the Canadians got a different idea. And then if we go to our, you know, the European model, which, of course, every snow weenie on Earth was was uh, was watching. This one's even even more different. I mean, you, the southern stream energy there. This is on the new. This is the zero Z. The 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 uh, the eighteen Z run. You know, it, it has a, a fairly sharp uh, but positively tilted trough here in the southern stream. You can still see what's left of the one in the northern stream, and then the one in the northern plains is just barely coming into the picture. So. Uh, again, uh, you know, it, it, is it is it one low? Is it two lows? Is the GFS right with it? Uh, are the other models right with the idea that it's just one low? And here's the uh, the 12Z run, so we can go a little further. 
Um, you know, if we run this, you know, this is the system for Friday night, Saturday. You know, not a half bad looking trough, and that's why the European bring makes it a closer call. And then all it does after that is you don't even have anything in the south coming out. It just overwhelms cold air uh, Sunday and into the first part of next week. I, I, like I said, I'm just genuinely confused. Well, you're not the only one. <laughs> exactly. Before we before we continue with the confusion, I want to thank a couple of people here on the chat board. David Fuller, who hit Super Chats tonight. And we also have, as I scroll down here, uh, ba, 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 don't tell me I lost it already. How is that possible? Uh, let me, let me, oh, there, there it is. Danielle Moreau. And she says, greetings from New Hampshire. Always enjoy this show and your commentary. Thank you very much, Danielle. Very nice. Thank you. Yes. Um, how many likes do we have since you can see and I can't? 96. Oh, no, we're 99. Oh, already. No, excuse me. 100. 100. We have 380 watching now. We have a, now 102 likes. Joe, it's climbing as I speak. Oh. Like that thermometer that you mentioned a few few moments ago. My it's word. Going up, up, up. Yes. All right. So I got the, the GFS surface. So why don't we take a look at this? This is the 18Z run. We're going to have a lot of fun with the 18Z run today. Joe, those likes are jumping like. Like like it's up to 118. It jumped like oh. eight, like like 20 in like 15 seconds. Leaping like leaping like happy rabbits. 135. Woo. All, right, all right, let let them climb. And in the meantime, yeah. Here's here's your Arctic front on Thursday morning. As you said, it might even start off as a little bit of rain, and then all of a sudden by five or six a.m. This is for seven a.m. You got that stripe of snow from. Uh, Eastern Massachusetts, all the way back down into West Virginia and Ohio. It's a relatively narrow band, even showing some darker blue there, which I thought was interesting. And then it moves out. I don't know why the GFS does this sometimes, where um, it has uh, cold air coming in and falling, you know, thicknesses to show that colder air. And the precip shows up green as rain. I, I, I'm not quite sure why it did that. Uh, but I, I'm just going to assume that that's 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 going to be snow because it should be cold enough. And then that moves away. Now here's what happens going into Friday and 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 Saturday and Sunday on the GFS anyway. The front stalls offshore again. You get a second wave that develops. You see the snow that breaks out. It's in Virginia, uh, the southern part of the Delmarva Peninsula, North North Carolina, Northern South Carolina, ice. Uh, down to the coast in South Carolina and Georgia. And then the low moves out east-northeast because it can't lift. Notice in the Gulf of Mexico, there's a second wave. And that produces ice suddenly in Georgia and in South Carolina and North Carolina again. Now that goes out further offshore. And this is what I don't get, Joe, because it's got one low that goes out and then a new low forms east of Virginia. And it's got this stripe of blue of snow there up through Jersey and into the Hudson Valley, that little stripe there, where does that come from? And again, is this real? Because the other models don't have this. And yet the GFS for two and a half days has been doing this run after run after run. And by the way, here's your Alberta Clipper you were dreaming about last week that ushers in the- I wasn't dreaming about it. I just, I mean, I, I, I was just saying, how come we don't see those anymore? And guess what? No sooner do I open my big mouth, but here comes- here comes an Alberta Clipper. And yet, now this really is a low on an Arctic front because behind it is bitter cold air. And that you need the passage of this. And that low, you know, as I was watching this as it moved southeastward and I thought, oh, it would be nice if it like dove down into West Virginia and redeveloped off the Delaware coast. And, you know, for then you wind up with a, a, a pretty decent snowfall before all the Arctic air comes rushing in. But of course, the, the run, the low take, it takes the low in northern Ohio, northwest PA, redevelops it somewhere south of Long Island, which is great for upstate New York and New England. And then you got a low east of Boston. But, uh, you know, it, it's it's not good for places like New York City and Point South. If the low develops right on top of you, you want the low to develop to your south. But this ushers in, you know, a very cold Arctic air for the second half of next week, which is what the climate folks were have been talking about for a, a week now, 
and then that high settles in along the East Coast. So again, I'll just go back to what I said earlier. You know, all these puzzle pieces, and, and by the way, the NAM, this is another thing that confused me today. The last run of the NAM, the last three runs of the NAM after the Arctic front goes by have been totally different in terms of how it handles uh, stuff in the South. But I'll just roll this back so we can see the NAM handling the Arctic front and make everybody happy if we wind up seeing a few inches on, on Thursday. I kind of hope it happens because just to make the snow lovers happy after, uh, for those that were, you know, so, so horribly disappointed by what, uh, it, how it turned out this weekend. So we'll let the circle of death go round and round and round. Okay, here we go. So finally some maps are coming in. All right, so here's uh, tonight. Uh, we'll roll along. Uh, here comes your Arctic front. You start to see the precip develop uh, back through uh, Kentucky and southern Indiana and Illinois. Uh, here we are now. It is now Thursday morning. Uh, your snow is here. You get that stripe of snow to move on through. This is 1 o'clock in the afternoon. By 4 o'clock, it's all offshore. Now, here's where it got confusing for me. If you notice, you got precip developing in the Carolinas. You got precip developing on the western Gulf Coast. But then I'm looking at this at, this is early Saturday morning. There's not much of a low here that's forming off the Southeast coast, but there is a low down in the central Gulf of Mexico. So, I mean, is there, I looked at this and I thought, is there even gonna be a lead low? Or if there is a lead low, it's gonna be very, very weak. And maybe there'll be, you know, most more of the energy would be with the second low. And then I looked at the upper air and I noticed on the upper air at the end of the forecast period that the the uh, the NAM really lags that southern trough behind pretty far back uh, in uh, uh, from Indiana down in, into western uh, western uh, Louisiana. You know, you don't really see much. I mean, there's hardly a kink here off the southeast coast. It's hardly a reflection of of, of, a, of a wave. You know, there's this trough that's up here in the northeast that's looks like it almost looks like, Joe, the southern part of that trough wants to shear, up, shear apart. I mean, shear away from the northern part there. I don't know. Again, I'm just really confused about this because this to me would say that there won't be much of a system Friday night into Saturday and that maybe you come up with something stronger for Saturday night into Sunday because now you got this northern thing coming down. Maybe I'm just overanalyzing it. I don't know. But then you got this oh, this northern thing coming down, and who knows? Maybe it catches up to the south, or 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 it you know tries to phase with it. I don't think I I honestly don't think that's going to happen. But I just got like I said, I'm 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 really confused about the weekend. Yeah, well, you you know that when one major model, the European, has one singular system and then you have the gfs which not just on one run but on more than one run has been splitting this in two and you know and, and other models are like not giving you a really clear picture you you know that you're gonna have to wait another day or so or day or two before hopefully things all end up on the same page but now, um now i'm gonna I, you know go ahead i'm sorry no i'm, I'm just i'm just saying you know for the you know i i watched and i snickered last night at a few forecasts and local New York television, you know, saying, watch out for the weekend, watch out for the big storm, watch out. And I said, you know, it's still five or six days away. And I mean, the, the energy, the 500 millibar energy that would energize this particular system was way up near the Yukon yeah. in the Northwest Territories of Canada. And I said, how much data set do you, can you get to input into the uh, supercomputer from that? It's very much like, I'll tell you what, Joe, here's an interesting analogy. It's on a it's on election night. You're watching, let's say, your local favorite TV station. Let's say there's, there's a, uh, an election for mayor in a, in a city, and uh, they 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 come in and they say the 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 TV station says we've just declared a winner. It's going to be uh, Mr. X. He's going to defeat Mr. Y. And then they announce we only have you know out of a thousand precincts we only have five or six precincts, but we're going to base our our, our election uh, prediction on those five or six precincts. That's basically what they're doing when they're telling you 
that there's a potential for a major storm over the weekend. They're basing it on a bare minimum of data, and the, the, the main batch of information isn't going to be inputted into the computers until, you know, Wednesday, Thursday. So why, why scare people by telling them, I mean, I, I got my hair cut today. And the, the person who cuts my hair, she said, so what's the story about Saturday? I heard I you're going to get buried, you know, and, and you just shake your head. Our, I, CBS, I our CBS News estimate, estimates indicate that Thomas Dewey <laughs> has defeated Harry Truman for president of the United States. So we know how that turned out. Yes. Um, Turner it, 85, Mitchell 23. 23. <laughs> now, uh, for uh, those of you who are inclined to look in the long, long range, I have to show you this if you haven't seen it already. Oh, yes. I know, oh, jo yeah. I, I know Johnny Quest saw it because um, Johnny, in, in, the, in the northwestern mountains of Virginia, uh, would would probably not be heard from for days if this winds up verifying. But anyway, let's let's run through the just for fun. We're going to run through this uh, on the long range as the maps hook up. So now we're into we're at next Tuesday, the 25th, and it's a little bit further along. Oh come on! Just every map is just like torture here. It's like somebody's taking sheets of paper and just methodically putting them down on the table one at a time. All right, here we go. So we're getting closer. All right, so uh, this is now... All right, so this is next Thursday. Here we go. There it is. Start the low in the Northeast Gulf. What does this remind you of? L low in Eastern North Carolina. Of course, it's raining already all the way up to the Hudson Valley. And we have a 970 low in Chesapeake Bay on Friday morning, on Saturday morning, January 29th. And then a nine, what is that, a 958 low near Hagerstown. Now, if this were to literally yes. verify, you're probably talking about two to maybe three inches of very heavy rain running up the East Coast, Eastern Pennsylvania, through all of New England. And an absolute burial for Western New York, Western PA, down into West Virginia. I looked at some of the snow amounts, Joe. There's like 35 plus inches, 35 inch snow <laughs> amounts are being given by this. I mean, this is just ridiculous. Uh, and then, of course, uh, for those of who would think that this low would, would would be offshore because the ensembles have it further east, it's got a nine. What is that? A 57 low or a 67 low? I can't read it. Uh, in uh, uh, sitting uh, somewhere near Wilmington, and then it goes up into northern Connecticut and then heads up into Canada. I mean, I saw this today. I was like, oh, this is – talk about talk about history not repeating itself but rhyming. Uh, this almost – I mean, it, it, it's, not, it's not quite the same because you don't really – you lose the bitter cold air long before any storm gets here. I mean, the high, the high goes out east of Virginia, uh, for God's sake. So you've got new cold air that comes down, but the trough is so far to the west that you wind up with a low that, that just explodes and runs northward. So, again, this is all obviously model fantasy. We know it'll probably, um, it probably will not be there on the next run, or if it is there, it's in a different place, or it's a whole lot weaker. But I'm just sharing this uh, for uh, all the uh, – uh, for all of those that were disappointed the other day. Uh, that uh, the model does something similar down the road. Again, it's fantasy land, uh, but uh, it, it was it is definitely worth, worth putting on the screen. So I am. But it's something. It, it's something for them to hang their hat on. It's something for them to hope for, and it's what January 29th? Uh, is that the date? That is January 29th. That weekend of the 29th and 30th. Yes. Well, good luck, there, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, that actually is Saturday. <laughs> that actually is one a. The map that was on the screen there, the last frame was was one a.m. Saturday morning with the low uh, down near um, near Wilmington, North Carolina. So, have at it. And there you go. <laughs> there you go. Oh, good lord. There you go. So we got a nice crowd tonight. Got over four hundred folks on. We're just uh, a handful of lights shy of uh, of two hundred, which is really good. So, um, you know. Just wondering, I, 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 uh, I didn't really. I, I should, I should, I should first off, 
there are some more super chat hits which I need to. Oh, absolutely. Uh, need to drive. We have uh, F F Forza Jersey. Forza, Forza Jersey. Forza. Roll your R. You're yeah. an Italian. Roll your R. It's Forza. With Forza. There you go. I can't roll my tongue. Anyway. Where's my snow in New Jersey? Always to south or north. So Forza Jersey wants, wants snow. Well, he probably We're lives doing on our best. If it's too south or too north, he must live near 195. Yeah. Our favorite, our favorite Jersey boundary zone. And Raymond O'Hara, thank you very much for uh, hitting Super Chats tonight as well. Now, Joe, I have a, I have a uh, little favor to ask you. I, have, I just sent you an email. Oh. And the email is, the email is a link for uh, registering for a talk. Now, I'm giving a library talk tomorrow night. And you actually are the guy who is behind this in a small way. You may remember back in 2019, you had a library in North Babylon, and they asked you, could you do a talk which combines both astronomy and meteorology? And you turned to me and said, would you like to take this for me? And I said, well, what am I going to talk about? So I did a bit of research, put together a program, which I call the science, actually, I should call it the pseudoscience of astrometeorology. Is there a way that you can use the sun, the moon, even, for goodness sake, the planets to forecast the weather? And over the last, again, this was in, 19, in 2019, what I did was I just kind of, over the, over the last few years, I've been adding and subtracting and massaging this. And so now I added my latest revised uh, piece of graphic uh, to this tomorrow for tomorrow night's talk. And now uh, the library that I'm doing this for said, invite as many people as you want and gave me this link. All you have to do is go to the link register and you're in the talk is tomorrow night at seven o'clock so i gave that to you so that you could put it on the chat board and if any of you out there want to and come I'm to going, this talk tomorrow I'm, night, do, I'm doing that right now uh, and there you go and meanwhile the chairman says hi joe jq weather family joe did you know that norm mcdonald no norm mcdonald he was meteorologist who said where storm enters west coast it exits east coast i knew norm mcdonald he, is, he uh, passed away some years ago, but he worked for AccuWeather, and he also worked, I think, for Weather Services Incorporated in Massachusetts for a while. And he was even on WBC with Donald Kent, uh, who was uh, uh, an earmark of uh, broadcast weather for many, many decades up in the New England area. And uh, I didn't know that, that he had a theory that where the storm enters the West Coast, it exits the East Coast. I, I think... I think it was John Coleman who said that a storm that hits the West Coast, a potent storm, will usually exit the eastern seaboard three and a half days later. So, if, for example, if you see a storm hitting San Francisco or Los Angeles, you can bet that somewhere along the eastern seaboard in three and a half days, that storm will be exiting and possibly influencing our weather rather adversely. So the, uh, um, the link, by the way, is up and it's pinned to the top of the chat board. So. Uh, those of you who are interested and want to register for this, it's a uh, virtual uh, meeting, so it's on Zoom, correct? It's a Zoom link. It's absolutely correct. All right, so uh, the correct. link is up there, is... which means any of you watching from anywhere uh, in the uh, USA uh, could uh, join, uh, to, and it's free, which is the best kind of it's talk free. to go to. It's free. Um, it would be Absolutely. great if they serve food virtually, but they don't do that. And uh, the chairman also did hit <laughs> the chairman also did hit the super chat tip jar. So we want to give him a uh, a big thanks to that. Uh, to, uh, a big thanks to you. And I'm just uh, now I can see the chat board. So uh, uh, we're up to 215 likes, and we've got 338 folks on. And by the way, for those of you who are new, uh, welcome to the Joe and Joe Weather Show. We're on five days a week unless there's a big storm, in which case we might be on six or seven. Uh, but we're usually on Sunday through Thursdays. Uh, um, Monday through Thursday, we are, uh, our usual start time is 7.30, unless Joe has a talk. Uh, and uh, then uh, Sundays, uh, we uh, do it on Sunday morning, a uh, nice relaxed show on Sunday morning, and that's usually at 11 a.m. Eastern time. So if you register, uh, on my YouTube channel with your Gmail account, you can get notifications every time the Joe and Joe Weather Show pops on. Plus, you get 
additional videos for me that I post my Weather in 5 video, which I do almost every day. Uh, so you uh, will always be on on top of uh, on top of the weather. I uh, I was watching the the uh, the weather coverage here uh, during uh, what was going on on Sunday, and I have to say there was one uh, one weather person I don't remember her name, uh, but she was actually pretty good. Uh, gave uh, gave context, showed uh, you know showed the radar. You had some of them that that were just kept showing you know there was stuff going on and all they did was kept showing like the future cast radar and all the rest of it. Uh, whereas you know in, in, instead you actually had weather going on and they weren't paying as much attention to it as they should have. But she did a really nice job. She was. Uh, she was very good. She, I, have to, I wish I could remember her name, but she was, uh, she was quite good. I'm going to try to see if I catch her again, uh, and I'll write her name. I got to write names down because I, I forget these things. Um, Invite her on Joe and Joe, Joe. Well, I have to, I have to find out who she is first. But I, yeah. you know, the, the, yeah. in comparison, uh, there was a, a lot of, there was a, 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 there was, there was a lot of icing uh, in. in it wasn't everywhere because there were these pockets where some places didn't get much, and then some places got um, a, a, a fairly substantial amount. I, I was watching and just sort of getting the feeling that I, I was watching. I could have been sitting in New York watching it. I could have been sitting in Philadelphia and watching it. Watching it. Uh, it just seems like there's this sort of almost formulated. There's just this. You know, they all do it the same way. It, it's 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 all the same. Whether you're up north or, or down south, in terms of the storm coverage, uh, they all do it the same way. I don't know, and I kind of shake my head because there isn't really a whole lot of creativity uh, when uh, you can switch from channel to channel and you just see you just see everything kind of laid out in the in, in the same fashion. Uh, I get bored with it pretty quickly. That's why that's why I don't watch t uh, I don't watch TV news very much, and I certainly don't watch uh, very much um, TV weather. You know, the, uh, the interesting thing is that most of the TV stations here in the New York area use the same type of weather graphic system. It's the WSI weather producer. We even used it when we were at, uh, at uh, Fios 1. And the thing that I, I, I laugh at is that when they show the seven-day outlook with an upcoming holiday, like let's say uh, Thanksgiving, you'll, you'll look at uh, Channel 2, you could look at Channel 4, you could look at Channel 7, and they all have the same thing, the same turkey jumping up and down and waving because it's the same graphics. It's just, it's the same thing. Same thing in Halloween with the pumpkin or with the 4th of July or anything else. It, and, and you say to yourself, you remember the days when you used to watch here in New York, you'd see a completely different type of graphic uh, for each weather forecaster. Like we all associated Tex Antoine, the late Tex Antoine with Uncle Wethby, and he drew on a on a big map uh, with, with, with a grease pencil. Frank Field would have more of an electronic type uh, weather board showing the forecasts off of that. Every forecaster was different. Every forecaster was unique. Today, again, like I said, Joe, they all show the same thing, the same future cast, the same type of graphics, the same uh, stuff on the, uh, the Mark holidays off on the seven day. There's no real you know, difference. And, I, and that's another thing too. It's been a long time. I don't think a single forecaster weathercaster here in the New York area shows you a weather map with isobars or a front. They all fall onto or they've attract, attached themselves to the future cast, the RPM model, and they just go with the flow. Whatever the RPM shows, they show their audience. And th look, that's where it is now. And you can see, look how the snow drops down into our area. And I say to myself, you realize, of course, this is just one computer model. There are other computer models that may have a different look at what the uh, what the uh, snow line, rain line is going to be or whatever, but they all rely on the same thing. And again, I, I feel so sad that they don't show things like, in, in a lot of cases, like a front or high pressure or isobars, for goodness sake. I think the last person in the New York market that showed isobars on a map was Alan Casper for good? I sake. used to, I used to put iso. I always put isobars on my map. Really? Yeah. I don't remember. All I remember. That's because you I never watched me. Is, oh, I watched you. 
I watch you with gritted teeth. You know why? Because they gave you so much time. Yeah. So I, I mean, they give me like at at News Twelve, I gave me like seventy seconds. If I gave one one second over seventy seconds, the the producer or the director would call me up and say, "Hey, you went over today. It was a heavy shot." Did you? You got sometimes like four or five minutes. I did. I had. I, I turned him or not. I, I had the best producer I in did. the world that had to fr- fill an hour show, uh, and uh, didn't have enough news to fill it with on a weekend. So I, she, I used to, I, I used to eat her time left and right. She loved me. She because if she felt, you know, if she felt into a situation where she had, she her show was like seven minutes short. She knew who could who could eat up at least five of those minutes. So it was good. And I, I said, to, I said. I said, I said to Renata, I'd be watching, we'd be watching you on channel 11, on Pix 11. And I'm looking at my watch and I'm saying, you know how long he's gone so far? He's like three minutes in and he hasn't even gotten to the forecast yet. Right. How does he do it? How does it, what time are they? Meanwhile, Izzy D, thank you. Uh, hitting super chat. And, and he also, Joe wants to ask, he yeah, also I wants saw. to ask, can we ever have a meet or uh, meet and greet at a kosher restaurant? Yes. Well, look, <laughs> I, I, uh, from that standpoint, I'm, I'm not, uh, because of my, um, medical situation uh, having to deal with what I'm dealing with with my tummy I am uh I'm not going anywhere anytime soon so uh, I'm I'm not coming up anytime soon but who knows maybe in the spring if uh, things move along um you know I'm I I I I'm, I'm going to have to come up eventually uh Eric P saying a 957 low would that carry strong winds also oh god if if that if that verified like that uh, east of the low center uh, it, you'd, they'd be blowing away. It'd be 50, you know, 50 mile an hour wind gusts all over the place. I mean, literally, if you took it the way the map was drawn, I mean, we're not, you know, again, that's in fantasy land 12 days from now. And, and I pretty much can guarantee it's not going to be there uh, on, on the, on the next run. Um, but yeah, that would be a uh, very, you know, pretty powerful, pretty powerful store. Broken wing asked, which model was more accurate for the storm that just hit the East Coast? I think the GFS, if I recall, uh, uh, the GFS was the first one to go left and inland. Uh, and the others uh, stubbornly yes. followed uh, over the course of the next couple of days. Um, I, I noticed, by the way, from the, the standpoint of, of the GFS model, that it, it has had a tendency in the last, you know, in the last probably the last couple of months as being more the leader, you know, kind of picking up on a trend earlier than the other models have. I mean, this, it used to be the European for the longest time would do that. And and I think the European has really lost it uh, from that respect. Um, And and as I said, with this particular system coming up, uh, the one for, you know, with the situation for the weekend and how things are playing out, uh, if you look at the last four or five runs of the GFS, they've been virtually identical. It's almost as if they're running the same, the same model run, uh, because I, I could find you know the, 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 there's very little difference from run to run. So and, and now the other models seem to the, the European with its big storm offshore that it had yesterday and the day before that's gone. Um, so you know it it, it um, so so it, it seems to be. Uh, going with the idea of the let's call it the flatter looking GFS, and um, the Canadian apparently has something has a, has a snowstorm for the end of next week because it handles whatever the GFS is doing. It's handling it differently. Who kn- again? That's all in the who knows category uh, as far as go- going down the road. But I, I think the GFS has been. I think the GFS actually has been pretty decent. A uh, de- pretty decent performer uh, in the last uh, in the last couple of months on, 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 as a whole. I mean, it's not perfect, but as a whole, I think it's it's been a, a pretty decent performer. And the NAM uh, was was at the best during the uh, actual storm because uh, it was the slowest in terms of the pushing of the warmer air to the north. The three kilometer even better than the twelve kilometer. Uh, the, the 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 more resolution. The slower the uh, movement of the warm air, the GFS was, for example, the GFS had the uh, the 32 degree line well north of me by one o'clock in the morning. It was still below freezing, and uh, the NAM was bringing up the rear, so to speak, 12 kilometer first, and again the best probably was the three kilometer. And, and we've often said, at least I've often said, 
that the coldest model, the colder model, is the NAM. And uh, in a situation like last night or actually on Sunday night, maybe you want to lean more toward the NAM in terms of the displacement of the colder air because cold air, especially at the surface, is difficult to dislodge. This was a situation where all the models were saying, we're going to push this, this cold air out and bring in the warm air. Yeah, it's true. In an overview of things, that did happen. But the best in terms of timing was the NAM. The NAM was the slowest. The NAM was uh, the one that said that the cold air would push out, but not all that quickly as uh, the GFS. And uh, I think in, for, for the actual storm itself, or when we were right there, the NAM uh, outperformed the GFS. But the GFS, you're right, Joe, was better in, in catching on to that idea first before all the other models. And as far as the European is concerned, I think it's about time that we all think that the European has had its day. It has been living off that forecast of uh, Hurricane Sandy, 2012, 10 years, folks. Ever since it made that giant left-hand turn, everybody remembered that. Oh, then the, the, the European, that's the model. That's the king and everything else. But you know what? Especially in recent years, it really, the European yeah. has. Uh, I agree. The, I, th I think it's time for the European to abdicate the throne. They did. <laughs> Joe Lapresti, <laughs> Joe Lapresti on the board reminded me about this, and it's yeah, you're right. They did. They did do an upgrade on the, on the European. I think a, a, a couple of years ago, or maybe it maybe maybe less than that, but certainly you know they got to go back at least a year, if not longer. But I remember the last upgrade that they did. It has not been the same since they did that upgrade. It really hasn't. Um, in, in right. both its short, because they, have, you know, the European actually, they've got long range stuff that goes out, you know, two months or even longer, because uh, people are always posting up Euro weeklies for uh, a month ahead of time or two months ahead of time or whatever it is. Uh, but yeah, ever since they did that upgrade, it just hasn't been the same. And on the other hand, um, I think they also did a GFS upgrade not too long ago, uh, within the last year. And since they did that upgrade, the GFS seems to be a lot better than what it was. So go figure. Um, one's a, uh, one's a, 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 a government, the GFS is a weather service, and the European is, a, I, I believe, is a private consortium that, that, uh, that has that. It's definitely not government. I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a corporate product of some kind. I don't, I, I don't know exactly who, but... Uh, from what I remember, I think it's a, it's a uh, it's a corporate product. Hey, have you been paying attention to this uh, this un the this volcano in the Pacific that's been erupting that everybody's been talking about? I I posted something on my uh, both of my Facebook pages today that it uh, it went the ash with that system that that volcano went about as high as any volcanic eruption in the last thirty years. And in fact, a friend of mine actually pointed out, Joe that it registered on barometers across North America. It put out such a tremendous air wave, so to speak, that barometers actually jiggled uh, during the day on Saturday when that uh, eruption took place across North America from west to east. Really? However, however, uh, there are climatologists who made a comment, again, this is on my uh, Facebook page, an article off of space.com that said that uh, this would not repeat, would not alter to any degree uh, the climate in the coming weeks or months, a la, let's say, Pinatubo from uh, the Philippines in 1991. But it, it was a very potent blast. So, so um, well, Johnny, Quest said, we were... Johnny Quest said the, the, uh, the ash column went up 139,000 feet. Yeah, well, wow. that, as I said, this was... This was this was one of the highest, most prolific uh, punches of of uh, aerosol, an aerosol cloud or ash and dust into the atmosphere in 30 years. In fact, thinking about it, 30 years, 30 years ago, that was Pinatubo. So this was probably the most significant uh, blast since Pinatubo. My only presumption is that maybe it was it was smaller in overall size than Pinatubo. Maybe that's why they think that there wasn't enough of fat, if you will, no, or schmutz put into the atmosphere to have a long-term effect on, uh, on, the, uh, on, on the atmosphere. James uh, Davison says it's only a matter of time when we actually get a super blockbusting blizzard along the I-95 corridor with all snow from beginning to end. 
Uh, I would agree with you, but I would also point out that that matter of time could also be a long time because uh, from the 83 blizzard to the uh, blizzard of 96, uh, 13 years in New York City went by uh, without um, a, 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 an area-wide big, big one from start to finish. So, uh, yeah, eventually it does happen, but it doesn't necessarily mean tomorrow or next week or next month nor next year or the year after. Eventually it does, uh, but uh, it could be a long stretch uh, before that happens. So uh, I- If any of you out there, and if any of you are snow lovers who really, and I think I mentioned this once before, there's a book that was written in 1979. The name of the book is simply Blizzard. And it is written by George Stone, not the former pitcher for the New York Mets, this is a different George Stone, but George Stone wrote a book called Blizzard. It was a novel right back in 1979, and it's, I, I thought it was a riveting book, and I'm wondering why it, it I really, I, I thought it should have been the kind of book that could have been turned into a movie, and it could have been one of those blockbuster movies. What happens, Joe, is basically the United States government secretly builds some sort of a, uh, a something off the mid-Atlantic coast in the ocean. Uh, a heating device uh, that warms the ocean waters that they're testing. Uh, whenever a storm passes near uh, that particular part of the ocean, they would turn this machine on, warm the ocean up, and try to see if they could possibly accentuate or make a storm stronger uh, as it moved up along the eastern seaboard. And in the book, what happens is, is that here's this little minor storm, might have been an Alberta clipper, moving across the mid-Atlantic coast, they turn this dynamo or whatever on, the ocean water gets warm, the storm passes over the warm waters, and the unfortunate thing is that for whatever reason, they can't turn the, turn the dynamo off, and the waters continue to warm, and the storm actually stalls along the mid-Atlantic coast for days, and like the, the, the amount of snow that's being measured or piling up in the Northeast Corridor from Washington to Boston is something like being measured in feet. I think it finally ends with like 85 feet of snow in Washington. Oh, that would have been the White House. That would have been enough for Burl Ives to cancel Christmas. <laughs> so, I mean, I know I'm looking here on Amazon.com. And if you're interested, this book is available. You can pick up this book. Again, Blizzard by George Stone. I got a kick out of it when it came out in 1979. My God, that's over 40 years ago. But if you're if you're really into, you know, snow... If you're a snow weenie and you really want to get into something like this, there it is. Blizzard by George Stone, available on Amazon, and I'm sure also on other sites like barnesandnoble.com or whatever. You might want to pick it up. I see paperback here, 15 used from, from $1.64. Oh. Not collectible. Maybe that was autographed by George Stone. $27. Uh, so the, 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 the price is reasonable. I'm not getting anything from this, but I just thought, I thought about this book just now after that comment about someday we're going to get a massive storm here in the Northeast. You want a massive storm? Pick up this book, Blizzard, 1979. Betsy Luna, uh, who I gave a, uh, a talk to her class back a few years ago, it was wonderful. Uh, had a wonderful time uh, with the uh, uh, the young ladies and gentlemen. And he and uh, she asked, uh, "Will the talk be recorded? I'm going to share the link with my astronomy class." Most of the most of the talks that I give, most of the talks that I give are uh, recorded. The library, this library, incidentally, is from your old stomping grounds, Joe. This is from the Middle Country Public Library on Eastwood Boulevard in Center Reach, beautiful downtown oh, Center yeah. Reach, New York. Yes. Then they will be uh, they will be sponsoring the talk uh, tomorrow. Uh, I've night given and, uh, I've given yeah. many library talks there. I I lived near there. Uh, Johnny, Johnny yeah. to New and Jay says the problem is if we could control the weather, we'd never be able to agree on on the weather we'd want. And I, I, I think uh, I, I think that's a good point. Um, the, the snow lovers would want it snowing in July. That's right. In fact, what happens also? I'm, I'm blowing the. I'm, I'm 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 a spoiler here, a spoiler alert. But what happens is that basically the whole. The whole mechanism across the northern hemisphere stalls. The book ends with like 85 feet of snow. I think the, the White House is about the, the ceiling is about to collapse there, uh, with the president already in place there, and it, it ends with snow beginning to fall in France, 
in Paris. Oh, it is snowing. <laughs> and because nothing is moving, you the implication is, is that, you know, it's going to start snowing in Europe and it's going to not stop snowing in Europe and Armageddon. So, so anyway, um... my sister, my sister's on the chat board and she's, and she says, bro, give your kid's book the cool story behind snow a plug. Yes. If you have anybody who, you know, that's in the second, the third or fourth grade and, uh, you want to explain to them the next time they have a snow day or next time it does snow to any significant degree, tell them to go out and get my book, the, uh, the uh, fun facts about snow that I wrote for Simon and Schuster back in 2015. And uh, a lot of parents said, gee, I learned stuff in that book that he, I didn't even know. And it's available, I'm sure, also on Amazon.com, Barnes and Noble, or you can call Simon and Schuster and say, hey, I want Joe Rayo's snow book. And uh, they'll they'll send it out to you at a reasonable price, paperback and hardcover, available now. Reasonable now, Joe. Reasonable price is good. All right, so why don't we uh, yeah. let's do? I uh, I got a Briller Jeopardy here. We haven't done that uh, in a while. Um, hang on one second. Um, I got it here up on the uh, on my board, so I can see. So tonight, uh, the category is uh, Jeopardy. So you should know because you watch Jeopardy on a regular basis. So uh, in Final Jeopardy, what is the name of the music that plays for the 30 seconds? There's actually a, there's actually a name for that song? Yes. I know, I know it originated when Merv Griffin was still alive. And uh, for all I know, Merv may have been the composer. I have no idea what the name of the song is. The 30-second the countdown, I don't know what it's called. Think, Joe, think. I I don't know, Joe. That's I, the name of the song. Think. 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 That's it. Yes, that's it. Think. Uh, in the you know that Merv Griffin, Merv Griffin got a Merv Griffin got a royalty for every time that song was played, and there was a time back uh, some years ago, Major League Baseball was playing that. So some stadiums were playing that when they were going to have a pitching change, not a pitching change, but when the catcher and the manager or the pitching coach came out to talk to the pitcher. And they're discussing it. That's supposed to go no longer than 30 seconds before the umpire comes out and says, all right, break it up. And they used to play that song. They're not playing it anymore because I think they played it to such a degree that Merv was making too much money. Of course, Merv and the, and, and the, anymore, No, but so. the estate probably gets it now, too. Uh, in, the episode, yeah, exactly. in, in the episode where Ken Jennings finally loses, what was the answer to the clue? <laughs> it has something to do with a hotel. I think it has something to do with hotels. Um, I know it's not Motel 6. Or did he answer the question using a motel or a hotel, but that wasn't the correct answer? I don't uh, know. The, the uh, H&R Block. So it must have been a tax question. H&R Block. H&R Block. That's what he, that's what he has here. So uh, next, okay. next question. What, what's the original name of Jeopardy in 1964 starring Art Fleming? Thank the you very much, ladies and gentlemen. gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. The original name. It take five minutes. Right. The it take five minutes before he found it. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're too kind. Thank right. you. Thank you. You know, uh, I didn't know that it had another name. I always thought it was Jeopardy. No, it, it, it's called, it was called What's the Question? Which, which would make some sense. And, you know, Jeopardy got started as a result of the quiz show scandals back in the 1950s. Yes. I mean, all these quiz shows, they were being accused of giving the answers behind the scene to the contestants. And one day on a, on an airline, on a, on a flight somewhere, Merv Griffin and his wife were, were flying and they were talking about this. And, and she turns to Merv Griffin and said, why don't you come up with a show where you actually give the answer to the question? And Merv didn't at least understand initially what, what that meant. And Merv's wife said, 73 Wistful Vista. And he said, Fibber McGee and Molly, that's where they lived. He said, you see, that's the question. You, you, you give the question from the answer. And that's, that's how it all right. started. Out of, well, that, out of that. And I was, you know, I actually uh, went uh, a number of times. So he's always used to write to, uh, for tickets and I would get them and I would go see Jeopardy being taped live when it was taped in New York City with Art Fleming. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. You're too kind. Thank you. 
He was a wonderful host. I'm not at all making fun of him. I, I thought he was great. Uh, in 1996, and he said he was a dummy. Yes. He said he was a dummy. In and he said, I, he said, unlike, unlike, unlike Alex Trebek, who was a very learned individual and actually knew many answers to the questions that were being asked on Jeopardy, Al, uh, uh, Art Fleming said, if it's not on this piece of paper that I, or that ha that I have in front of me when I'm reading off the answers, I, I, don't, I don't know. know it. Don't ask me what the answers are. Yeah. In 1996, <laughs> in 1996, which guest host switched with Alex Trebek for a one day special? That was, I think, on April Fool's Day, and it was um, they they switched uh, Wheel of Fortune. Pat Sajak was on right. Jeopardy, and Alex Trebek went to Wheel of Fortune. Ken Jennings' streak of winning shows ended at seventy-three. Uh, he's got seventy-four. And Amy, Amy uh, so so maybe on the seventy-fourth show, show he lost. So he did one seventy-three in a row, and then on the seventy-fourth show he lost. Maybe that's what. What, well, what? Amy Amy Schneider won. Amy Schneider tonight won her thirty fourth game. There was only two people ahead of her in terms of consecutive wins, and um, Ken Jennings, who now hosts Jeopardy, said to her before tonight's show, he said, "Well, if you go through the rest of this week without losing, there's only going to be one person in front of you." And he he just pointed to himself. And, well, uh, the way she's going, I I would not doubt that she could actually approach Ken Jennings seventy four or seventy three, whatever. What was the most money ever won on a single game? I think that's Holzhauer. Right. I think James Holzhauer won like I think James Holzhauer won something like something ridiculous, like one hundred and thirty-four thousand in one game. One thirty-one, one twenty-seven was the was the total. One hundred thirty-one thousand. Oh, what was the lowest score ever in a single game? Well, I know that there have been a couple of times when all three contestants ended up with zero. Oh, I've seen um, that, yes. But I'm assuming that there was at least once where somebody won with $1. Yes. Uh, right. But what was the lowest uh, score? Um, so, uh, you know, person was obviously eliminated and can't couldn't play Final Jeopardy. Oh, that happened fairly recently. I think uh, I think somebody lost with something like minus... Minus... Uh, I want to say 2,300, although I think it was even lower than that. Uh, the uh, rec the uh, it was minus 7,400. I don't know if it was recently. 7,400. Uh, minus yeah, 7,400. It, it was recently. Patrick Pierce uh, is the holder of that uh, grand record. Uh, who are the only four Jeopardy contestants to earn over one million dollars in their initial runs? Oh well, the, we have uh, I think Matt Amodio. Right. He he in fact came just. He came just before Amy Schneider. We have Ken Jennings. Um, did Holzhauer do it? I'm not sure if James Holzhauer did it. And there was one other guy, one of the one of the guys who who won that much money, but he wasn't. He won it in five days. So I'm not I'm not too clear on that. So Jennings, uh, Amid, Am Amadio, uh, Holzhauer did, and so did Amy Schneider. Right. Amy Schneider, of course, is, is there right now with like a million, 1.1 million. Within 20, the number, right, within 20, the number of Emmys. That the show won, not, not, not yes, the host. at the show. Within 20. Uh, they must have, oh God, the show has been on for so many years. Uh, I'll say 15. 39. Uh, how, many, how many? How many games? How many games ended with all three contestants having zero? How many times has that happened? I think that's happened like three times. Seven times. And the bonus. And the bonus question is: How much money is it possible to win in a single game of Jeopardy? Is it three hundred thousand, four hundred thousand, or five hundred thousand? I'll say 500,000. And you would be correct. 500,000. So that's it. Those were that, our 10 Jeopardy questions for today. Isn't that amazing? Yes, yes, it is most amazing. And you know what time it so, is? Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Joe. So tomorrow, I mean, it's, yeah, it's 8.56. Yes. We've been, on for, we've been on for like an hour and a half. Yes, which means the new NAM has begun which means we should say goodbye. But before we say goodbye, just a reminder, Joe's got a talk tomorrow 
uh, on um, astro meteorology. Is that what I did? I get that right? Yes. Okay. And uh, it it's the uh, pinned on the top of the chat board is the link to the Zoom link where you can register because it's a virtual um, a virtual talk. So all of you are invited. Uh, just uh, click on the link and do whatever you got to do uh, when you when you uh, when you go to the link and uh, you can go see Joe's talk. And that's at what time tomorrow? Seven o'clock. Seven o'clock, which means that tomorrow night the Joe and Joe show will be on at eight eight twenty eight thirty. So an eight thirty start tomorrow night to the Joe and Joe weather show. Okay, which so- Which means we'll have the, and which means we'll probably have the NAM tomorrow night to look at. That's right. We'll have the new NAM and we'll be even more confused as ever. Yes. So on that note, thank you all of the Super Chat hits, hits tonight. Uh, most appreciated. Um, and uh, we, we are um, thankful for your generosity. Uh, nice to see that we had a, Really large crowd tonight, and uh, for those of you who are new to the YouTube, the uh, Joe and Joe Weather Show, welcome. Uh, you can uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel with your Gmail account, so you get notifications every time the Joe and Joe Weather Show is on. We are on five days a week, and if there's big storms around, sometimes we're on six or seven days, um, uh, Monday through Thursday, usually at 7.30, except for tomorrow night, we're going to move it to 8.30, and some days we're usually on at 11.00. Uh, 11 a.m. Eastern time for a nice, uh, casual Sunday morning show. So uh, we'll see. Thursday, by the way, Joe, Thursday, Thursday, I have a, another talk. So I have back to back talks this week. So tomorrow night, 830 Thursday at 830 as well. OK, great. So then we'll have the new we'll be able to live stream the new NAM on Thursday and be even yes. more confused than we will be tomorrow. Yes. So so on. Uh, on on that note, I'll just say you have a. Oh, I, I can't. My, I got. I got to get new glasses. My glasses are. I know, it's time for me to way, get I new know, glasses. I can't I know read. My mother is watching. If my sister's watching, my mother is. Well, watching. Well, hi, gonna, hi to I'm Lisa gonna, and hi to Mother Rayo. Big hello. I'm going to do a Carol Burnett. I'm not going to do a Carol Burnett to. Uh, you know, take note of the fact that they are watching, and I'm going to pull my ear just like Carol Burnett used to do on her show all right uh, that was for her grandmother so yes hi mom hi lisa you know, call uh, in a few minutes okay <laughs> everybody have a great night stay safe and um we'll see we'll see you tomorrow again 8 30 eastern time tomorrow good night everybody nighty night yeah